Galatians 2, and we're going to uh, start at the 11th verse. We may go to some of the other areas, but we want to uh, share what I believe the Lord has given us to share. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord God, for another day that you've given us in the land of the living. It is not because of our goodness, but it is because of your mercy that we're not consumed. Father, I pray right now that your word will go forth and minister to your people, O oh God, and bring life. Lord, you said that the word of God is given for correction, uh, that we might be uh, thoroughly furnished in the things of God. Let, let this word sink down in the hearts of your people, O oh God. And Father, and cause them, O oh God, to walk in your will, your way, and your word. I bind the works of the enemy that would try to confuse this word, would try to distort it. Father, and I pray right now, and I say to the holy angels of God, bind every demon spirit in chains that cannot be broken and close and muzzle the mouths of the naysayer and the accuser of the brothering. And Lord, and let your word bring forth much fruit in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Verse number 11 uh, of Galatians, the second chapter, it says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I would stood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew liveth after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compelleth thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, excuse me, in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. I wanna, I wanna uh, minister what I believe the Lord has placed on my heart, and I wanna talk about a godly confrontation godly confrontation it is I was and this really let me say because I'm going to be sharing a, 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 I believe a, a lot and I'm and so I'm going to have to try to bring all of this together but I want uh, I was I had a dream uh, uh, several days ago and the Bible says tell a dream as a dream I had a dream I, and, and in the dream I was sitting at the table with uh, in, in fact I was the I was the only African American sitting at the table and we were sitting actually sitting at many tables it was a group of and I understood that I knew some of the ministers that were there and we were sitting around the table uh, these tables and we were discussing certain issues we were discussing certain issues um, and um, and different ones were expressing themselves and giving their opinions. And then it was my turn to speak. And I began to express myself and talk about 
uh, certain issues. And uh, it looked like people were listening and things seemed to be going, you know, going well. I was expressing, uh, you know, my opinion, what I, what I felt, the word of God, and so on and so forth, and these issues. And, uh, and it was like a break. We had a break. And then when we came back together again, I noticed that some of the people were not there any longer, but some of the other ministers were there. And I came in, and uh, they were all sitting there, and, um, and they began to talk to me about what I said in the meeting. And they begin to say to me that I offended many of the ministers there by what I had spoken. And of course, you know, what I had spoken was very simple and it was not something that was, but it was something that was contrary to what they wanted to hear, I'm sure. And as a result of that, uh, they were bringing me on the carpet and they were telling me that I had offended some and, uh, and that about what I said, and I was saying to them, you know, I said, well, this is what I said, that's, and, 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 but what, and then, of course, after they brought me on the carpeting and was talking, then I woke up, and, and, and the Lord began to let me realize and understand and uh, what was going on there, is that in the, in the church of Jesus Christ, you know, and uh, there, is, there are, are certain issues that we don't like to talk about. We don't like to discuss certain issues because certain issues, we, we don't have them on the top of our list as, as something that God is really concerned about. And, uh, and, and so I understood that, that the Lord was letting me know that the things that I would say many times or I would be saying will not sit well with everybody in the church. But, but I must speak the word of God, and I must confront uh, error. I must confront that which is not true and that which is, uh, uh, which is not of God. And so I say that, to, and then the Lord uh, had me go to this scripture. I was going to preach. I had a real good message. I was going to preach on the anointing, and, oh, I was ready for it and everything. And then the Lord shifted me and said, I want you to no, I want you to go to Galatians because you talked about, you spoke in Galatians 3 about Galatians, you Galatians, who has bewitched you? Remember I talked about that. And so the Lord said, but you need to go into more, a little bit more depth of what that is so that people can understand. Uh, so I'm going to talk today out of this particular scripture in Galatians. And uh, let me give you some background on it. And if you, if you start at the first verse, it actually talks, Paul is actually talking about the issue of, of whether the Gentiles, of, of, of the Gentiles having to go back under the law of Moses and conduct themselves under the law uh, of, 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 of Moses in order to be saved. Also, he deals with the issue of circumcision, which was the sign of the covenant that was made with, the, with Abraham and God. And, and uh, so he was dealing with those issues. He actually, in the first verse, actually goes back and he actually references, he references the, uh, uh, the, the 15th chapter of the book of Acts. And I'm going to go there because I want to... Um, I want to give context to what we're talking about so that we understand where Paul is coming from. In, in, the, in, in, in the 15th chapter of Acts, in, uh, the, the, um, and I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation. It says, while Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers, unless you, be, you are circumcised, as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent the delegates to Jerusalem, and they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers. They told them much to everyone's joy that Gentiles too were being converted. Then they arrived in Jerusalem and Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. 
But then some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted the Gentiles convert. The con converts must be circumcised as required to follow and, and, and required to follow the law of Moses. So the apostles and elders met together to resolve this issue. And at the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brethren, you, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts and he has confirmed and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So why are we now challenging God by burdening the Gentiles believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear. We believe that we are all saved the same way by an undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone listening quietly as Barnabas and Paul told them about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done th uh, to them, uh, through them among the Gentiles. Then when they were finished, James stood and said, brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. For this conversion of the Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted as it is written. Afterwards, I will return and restore the falling house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles. All those I have called to be mine, the Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. And so my judgment, this is James, the apostle of the Jerusalem church, the brother of Jesus. So my judgment is that we should not make a diff it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from the eating of food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating of meat, strangled animals, and from consuming blood for these for these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. Now, I'm just giving you that already this particular issue of the Gentiles coming under Judaism, coming under the, the law of Moses, had, all, had been dealt with in the 15th chapter of Acts. And, and, uh, and, and it had been made clear that the church was to be a church of not just one ethnicity, but it was to be a church of Jew, Gentile, bond free, uh, male, female. There was no difference. He was, te in other words, praise God, and the Gentiles and the church was not to be obligated to go under the Jewish laws. Now, I said something last Sunday, and I'll say it again. We must be very, very careful that we don't try to mix Judaism with Christianity, that we don't try to put ourselves back under the law in which has already been dealt with. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. He is our Passover. And we need to understand that we cannot mix these things. Now, I understand that, that, that we, that learning from the, the, the Old Testament scriptures, which the Jews called the Tanakh, but we, it is the Old Testament scriptures that, that we learn about the feast and we learn about the, uh, the Atone, Day of Atonement and all those things. And those are wonderful. They're revelation that comes from that. But we must never get to the point where then we are mixing and we are mixing Judaism and mixing uh, uh, Old Testament's uh, 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 regulations of the Jews to Christianity. We are not justified by the law. We are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen, somebody? And so they had dealt with this issue. In fact, Paul starts out in Galatians 2. He says, 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus also with me, I went up by revelation and communicated to them the gospel which I preached. In other words, he says, I went up and talked to them about what I was preaching to the Gentiles. And of course, I'm not going to go through all of this, but you can read it when you have an opportunity. And it'll tell you that they, there was a consensus with the, with the apostles in Jerusalem 
of the message in which Paul was preaching to the Gentiles and it had no requirement to keep the law. It had no requirement to keep the Sabbath. It had no requirement for his God to, 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 uh, uh, to, to honor the feast days. It had no requirements of those things. The only requirements that they gave to them and I will and, and, and he says here I, I'll read this. He said that um, um, that the only thing, the only, verse 10, the only, only they, uh, excuse me, let me, let me, let me uh, read verse 9 first. And when Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Verse 10, only they would that we should remember the poor the same which I also was forward to do. In other words, they didn't, they didn't put any requirements on us. They, we didn't have to keep no feast days. We didn't have to, we, we, we didn't have to try to, uh, uh, you know, have service on Sunday. I mean, on Saturday, we didn't have to try to keep a whole lot of Jewish stuff. Because why? Because the Gentiles and, and the Jews are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. The Bible says in First John, and excuse me, in St. John, the first chapter, it says that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by who? Jesus Christ. We better stick with Jesus. We better stick with his word. We better stick with him, focus on him, and not focus on other things. When we try to connect other things to the gospel that, that are under the law, we, we, we break and we, and we limit our liberty in Christ Jesus. Amen? Okay. So he says here in verse 11, now let's get into it, and I'm going to go into it in the, um, I'm going to read it in another translation. Um, the uh, Galatians 2 and, I'm on, and 11 and I want to look at it I'm going to read it in the, in a, in the uh, NIV translation the NIV translation says this when Cephas talking about Peter came to Antioch I opposed him to his face because he stood he stood condemned for before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. And when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, Peter, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not as a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because by the works of the law, no man is justified. Now what he does is he confronts Peter on this issue. But he is confronting Peter not so much about the the, the, the fact of the circumcision, although he's talking about that also and coming under the law, but he's confronting Peter also for his, his uh, separation from those who were of a different ethnicity, a different nationality. You know, the Gentiles were not Jews. And now the same Peter that had a vision from God that showed him that whatever God cleanses, don't you call common and unclean. He is now doing, he is now discriminating against the Gentiles in front of the Jews. We have to be very, do you know God hates racism? God hates a, a prejudice. And Peter was showing his prejudice. 
You say, how can that be? This is the same Peter that preached the message uh, to Cornelius for the Gentiles to be saved. God had already given him a revelation that there was no difference between uh, the Gentile and the Jew as it, as it was for being saved. But now he gets in the midst of his, his Jewish homies and decides to separate himself. This division, this division was, was egregious. Paul said it was it was hypocrisy. And, and you know what Paul, Paul said? I confronted him to his face. Because when leaders, elders, those that are in positions of authority in the church do wrong, in Titus the fifth chapter, it tells us that we are not to rebuke an elder, but when we have sufficient witnesses against him but when we find out that he has done wrong we are to rebuke him in front of everybody in the church some folks say well you know don't say we are to speak certain things in the open so that they can be dealt with and the bible says so that others will recognize that this is wrong and they will fear so when i make a mistake I cannot make, I cannot be a public preacher, a public pastor, a public apostle, and when I make a mistake, praise God, publicly, then I'm trying to get uh, rid of it secretly. Paul said, I confronted him to his face because he separated himself. And when he separated himself, being Peter, the pillar, the one that preached the message on the day of Pentecost, surely others followed him. We must be very careful when we are in leadership. We better be very careful when we, when we, when we are responsible for, the, for, for overseeing people. We got to be very, very careful that we don't do things that will cause the church to be divided, that will cause the church to, to, to break off into cliques and, and clubs. We, we have to be very careful that what we do does not divide the church because God hates division in the church. God hates anything that causes causes us to not walk in unity and let me tell you the thing that keeps us focused and keeps us together is that if we stay with Christ as our Savior as our Lord as our Passover as our propitiation as our scapegoat as as, as our Sabbath praise God if we stay with that praise God we'll not get off he confronted him to his face his prejudice because see, some things are so embedded in individuals. You got to realize Peter was raised, he was a Jew. Some things are so embedded in you that if you're not careful, you, you, God can reveal to you that that is wrong. But if it's so embedded in you until when you get in certain circumstances, those things that are in you will come out. And Peter's prejudice is coming out. His racism is coming out. Now, I know this is not popular, but God is getting ready to deal with racism in the church. I don't care what nobody say. Some folks think God, God is going to deal with racism in the church because it divides the church. God does not have a black church, a white church, an Ethiopian church. He has one church called the body of Christ, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And whenever you attack and come against the body of Christ, you are coming against Christ. That's why when Paul was killing Christians, when, when Jesus confronted him, he did not say, Paul, he said, Paul, why persecute thou me? You messing with my body, you're messing with me. You messing with my people, you're messing with me. You're dividing my people, you're trying to divide me. And Christ is not divided. He confronted him to his face because he, he separated himself from the Gentiles. And, 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 and I begin to understand God, let me know. Is, uh, let, let me show you something that Paul said. It's interesting. Look in, in, in verse, look at Galatians, because this is why people do this many times, is why you get caught up in, 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 in acquiescing to, 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 to what is the popular opinion is, is because you don't want to seem out of place. You don't want to seem like that, 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 that you're uh, 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 
a, a, a sore thumb in, in the midst of all everybody. In other words, you don't want to stand out as somebody that, that's wrong. You want to go along with the crowd. But look at what Paul said. Paul said, I went down to Jerusalem. He said, in, and he said in fifth verse of, of Galatians 2, he said, and to whom gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, and that the truth of the gospel might continue. But these who seem somewhat whatsoever they were, <laughs> it maketh no matter to me. God accepts no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Oh, let me read it in another translation. I want you to see, don't be intimidated by people. Stick with the truth. Say the truth. If everybody else is telling a lie, stand up and tell the truth. Don't be afraid of people. Let, 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 me, let me read it in, in the New Living Translation. New Living Translation, verse number six. Verse number six of Galatians 2, and it says in the New Living Translation, the leaders of the church had nothing to add to what I was preaching. By the way, their reputation is great, uh, as great leaders made no difference to me. I don't care about your favorite TV preacher. If he's here, I will tell him the truth. You cannot divide God's people by political parties and think that God is pleased with that. You cannot put an addendum on Jesus and say, in order for you to be saved, you got to know Jesus and you also got to be a Republican or a Democrat. You got to, we got to cut this thing. It is dividing the church. It is, it is breaking up, praise God, friendships and relationships. And we, somebody needs to confront some folk to their face. Oh, Lord. Let me read it again. And the leaders of the church had nothing to add What? to what I was preaching by the way by the way their reputation as great leaders made no difference to me for God has no favorites you might have some but God don't have any favorites right is right for me wrong is wrong for me it's from the preacher to the pew it's no difference for me and praise God it doesn't make any difference praise God how many members I got it don't make any difference how many people I'm talking to it don't make any difference how big and how well known my name is praise God if I am wrong I am wrong and this division in the church must stop and somebody must stand up and say we must deal with this because now we are separating we got a black church and a white church and God is not pleased Verse 7, he says, in, he said, in other words, it didn't make no difference to me who they were because God is not, God don't play favor. He ain't, he, he ain't looking and say, oh, 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 you know, some people, oh, oh, you know what so-and-so said? You know what, what, what big, big time preacher said? Look, I want to hear what he said, but it better be in the word and it better be about God. It better be in the spirit of the truth because if it ain't, I'm going to have to just say, God bless, I respect, I love, but no, that's wrong. We got to call wrong, wrong, and right when it's right. We've got to, we cannot play partiality because God is not partial. Thank you, Jesus. I know it's tight, but it's right. Verse 7 said, instead, they saw that God had given me the responsibility of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as he had given Peter the responsibility of preaching to the Jews. Now, I'm going to say something here because I wanted to go over social media and because and, and I know some, some, I know some folk, because I, I can tell by what they say that they hear my messages. So that's good. I want them to hear it. I want them to hear it. But let me say this, is that, that we have to be very careful in the body of Christ that we're not pulling down and biting and devouring one another and saying things. And I heard this preacher say this, and I was very, it, it, it bothered me in my spirit. It was not because I am a pastor, but it's because it was not in the spirit of Christ. It was not in the spirit of love. It was not speaking the truth in love, but he was talking about, this is what your pastor got wrong. This is what he, and talking about pastors. And I remember, and you know what, what this is, let me tell you something about ministry, is that I've been in ministry 
ministry, where I've been in, in, in ministry, where I've had a itinerant ministry, where I've ministered at, at revivals and so on and so forth, and, and somewhat of evangelistic type of ministry, and now I'm in a pastoral ministry. And I like what I heard Dr. Hagen say one time. He said, he said, every evangelist needs, he said, I, I, every evangelist needs to pastor for a while. And every, and every pastor needs to be on the evangelistic field for a while. Because if the evangelist pastored for a while, they wouldn't say what they say about the pastors. And if the pastors evangelized a while, they wouldn't say what they say about the evangelist. In other words, walk a mile in my shoes. Don't tell people to stop listening to their pastors. The Bible says, I will give you shepherds after my own heart that will feed you with knowledge and understanding. I am your shepherd. I have laid my life down for the people of God. I, 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 I love you. I, I serve you. I do not serve myself. And I have a responsibility. The Bible says, tells us that, that there's a responsibility that I watch for your soul. I don't want to see any of you lost. I don't want to see any, but praise God. But it's different when you are talking from a pastoral stance. And the evangelists can stand and criticize the pastors, the pastor this, don't do that. Look, you should never be telling people that, uh, 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 and turning them against their pastors. I don't care who you are. And I was so, I said, Lord. But see, I don't know if that individual ever pastored. But, but it's different when you're pastoring. You know, evangelist was standing up. Yeah, you know, y'all don't have no faith. You know, you said just, you know, you know, just have church. You know, just fill it up. You know, just everybody sitting next to one another. What are you, are you scared of the coronavirus? No, I'm not scared of the coronavirus. But I got enough sense and enough wisdom to understand that my faith may not be your faith because the just shall live by his faith. And, 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 and what is wrong, what is wrong with, with taking wisdom and using wisdom and, and being responsible because you're responsible for all of these people as the pastor. You're responsible. Their lives, you can't put their lives on the line. Now, if God told somebody else to do it, that's the pastor. But don't get on and make out like the pastors, like somehow we are wrong because we don't agree with your analysis of what we should do during the pandemic. Okay. Paul dealt with him to his face. And he said it was hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy. When we, when, when we, when we don't, when we, when we cause separation in the body of Christ. It's, it's, it's not God. That's not God. God is not, God does not condone that. And then we must be very careful. I was I want us, and I, and I put a, a request in to our intercessors to pray for, um, for Bishop um, Glenn Plummer. I don't know, if, any, I don't know if, if many of you have heard what has happened to, to uh, Dr. Plummer. Uh, you know, he has is, he is relocated to Israel. Some of you might have seen it on the 700 Club. They interviewed him. I spoke with him on yesterday, prayed with him, spoke with him. I want us to pray for him and Pauline. He has death threats on his life. And, um, but what we have to understand is that that, that same Phariseeism that wanted to kill Jesus and that eventually killed Jesus is still alive today. That devil has not died. We must be very careful that we don't get... You know, I, I, I love studying. The Bible talks about the revelation of, of all of the, the, the feast and everything. But when, when we are living our life according to feast and, and so on, Jesus is our feast of Passover. You can get your healing anytime. 
You don't have to look at a Jewish calendar to get your healing. I can pray for you right now in the name of Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He can still work a miracle right now. I ain't got to wait for one time. I ain't got to wait for 5779. That's the time when Jesus is really healing. No, Jesus is healing every day, every way. Anybody that will exercise their faith can receive from Jesus Christ. And we can't get so prophetic until we get pathetic. Well, we're all over the place. We've got to stay with the word of God. We've got to stay with Jesus. He is the true prophet. He is the prophet of prophets. Amen? Okay. I'm, we cannot go back into these things. And I, and I, and I see there's, a, there's almost a moving. I was, I, I, you know, and, and some of us don't even, don't even understand that that old Judaism, it has a spirit with it. And we have to be very careful that we don't take on that spirit. The, 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 um, when I talked with Dr. Plummer, one of the things was I, was, um, I, I, I knew already that they had laws in, 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 uh, in, in Israel that you could not proselyte. They, it's laws that you cannot evangelize Jews see but most people don't know that they just think you know and so we get all caught up in in the fact that they put the the the, the embassy on in Jerusalem and we say oh praise the Lord look at what that's all good but do you know who died for the Jews just like he died for the Gentiles and when we start when we start causing there to be a separation in the sense that there is not equal opportunity salvation for everybody. They got a, salva a way of salvation, then we got a way of salvation. That's a dangerous place to be. Okay. Let me, let me, let me uh, say this also, because I'm, I'm, I'm closing. I, I want you, to, un I want you to, to understand, and this is what I'm getting at, is that godly confrontation is necessary many times. Paul talked to Timothy and he told him that he said, preach the gospel. Be in season and out of season. You know what he said? He said, rebuke, reprove, exhort. We love exhortation messages. I love preaching exhortation messages. I mean, I, I love to preach it when it's a response. Say yes, you know, and all. But there is a time when we need to uh, send a rebuke through the church that causes the church to think and have a sea light moment and say, look, we are not going to live in division. We've, we've got to be able to come together. And everybody, we've got to listen to, to, to the whole community like they did in the 15th chapter of Acts. They came together and they adjudicated that issue. And what the Lord was letting me know in the dream is that here it is, you thought you were at a mature uh, uh, apostolic adjudication of the issues of the church, and now you come back. Because what they told me when I came back, they said, you know, some people are not, they're baby Christians. I'm thinking to myself, I thought we were at the, uh, I thought we were at the Jerusalem <laughs> uh, council, and here it is, we got people in diapers and pampers and, and drinking pablum and Similac and Infamil. The church must mature. We must be mature leaders that can sit down and work these things out. We have differences, yes, yeah, but we need to be able to sit down, work them out, come up with the consensus based on the word of God and praise God and to be able to walk in unity. I'm not talking about uniformity, not everybody the same, but I am talking about unity. Unity is not uniformity. Unity is harmony. It's, it's differences coming together to make a blend of harmony so Paul said I, I confronted him to his face because I had to deal with it in front so some things you can't deal with in the back Say, Why don't, you, don't talk about that apostle sometimes you have to talk about it publicly because, because you have to understand that you're not just dealing with people you're dealing with a spiritual realm that, that has demons and devils that are, that are observing. But also in that spiritual realm, the Bible says we are, we are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. There is, a, there is an audience in the spirit realm 
of those that have gone on and also of demon spirits, praise God, and angels, praise God, that are beholding us and are seeing our walk and seeing if we're staying true to Jesus, if we're staying true to the gospel, if we're staying true to the word of God, or whether we have veered and whether we have gotten into error, whether we have gotten into division. Paul said it in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, when he talks about, he said, he said, some are saying I'm a Paul, some are saying I'm a Apollos, some are saying I'm a Peter, and he said, did they die for you? Did I die for, did Pastor Hogan die for you? No. Did your favorite TV preacher die for you? No. Jesus died for me. So my allegiance is to Jesus. And I don't, and I'm not going to be divided by, 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 by issues, praise God, that, that, praise God, that, that don't unite us. They divide us, praise God. And somebody had to deal with Peter because Peter was not only affecting, his, his prejudice was affecting. Barnabas ended up getting on his side and praise God. And folks started following him, praise God. And you know what? There was a division in Antioch. And Antioch is the, is the prototype church, that, that New Testament church, not Jerusalem. Jerusalem was an all-Jewish church. But Antioch, the Bible says in the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, it says there were certain prophets and teachers at Antioch, and it names them. It's Niger. Niger is, is a black man. Do you know that? Praise. It talks about those that were inherit of hatred. It was, it was royalty in that. It was a political people in that. It, it was different races in that. Why? It was Gentiles. It was Jews. In other words, the Antioch church was more of a representation of what God wanted the church to be than the Jerusalem church. They were stuck in the Jerusalem church. Do you know God had to send persecution in order for the Jerusalem church to do what they were supposed to do? They were preaching the Jews. They were ministering the Jews. They, that's all they were doing in the Jerusalem church. But Jesus said, take this message throughout the whole world. He said, to the Jew first in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And they were all gathered in Jerusalem. Let me give you some a prophetic insight. Persecution is coming to the church, but God is allowing it so that we can do what he's told us to do. The church has gotten in its little cliques, its clubs, separated itself, then got its little, uh, uh, you know, its, its little, 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 uh, 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 cliques and, and little clubs and little, little, little groups and praise God. And now God is saying, now, I'm going to force y'all together. You watch what I tell you. God's going to force you to have to work with some folk that you don't look like. And sometimes if you, oh, I'm worried about if, 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 if these people get in the office, then, then you know, uh, what, what are we going to do? Well, let me tell you something. Sometimes God has to put somebody in office to, to cause us to be persecuted, to cause to put some pressure on us so that we will uh, get rid of all of this animosity, that we'll get on our knees, that we'll fall on our knees sometimes, praise God. Sometimes the best thing to happen to you is an attack of the devil because an attack of the devil calls you to fall on your knees, calls you to turn your plate over, calls you to start praying, calls you to start fasting, calls you to start, praise God, leaning on God. Why? Because you're going through trouble. And the church cannot be afraid of persecution. Mm. Peter, you're a hypocrite. He said his hypocrisy, because you've separated yourself from the Gentiles. You won't eat with them. We will never, the church will never come together until we can get together, sit together, and work these things out. If we don't do that, we will never get this thing done. Peter, with all of the revelation he had about the Gentiles, ends up, because that stuff's so instilled. One of the problems, in, especially in the church in the United States, is this, is that there's such an embedded uh, racial racism that's so embedded in this nation, so embedded in this nation, that has never been dealt with, and it is embedded in the church. And what has happened is, 
is that we've, they, we've been able to push it down and push it down and push it down and hide it. But as soon as we get with the right people, we side with those people for fear. But see, I, we cannot, you cannot be a person that is intimidated by famous people, famous preachers, famous prophets. You cannot be intimidated by that. You can draw from there and be blessed by it, but you can't be intimidated. You've got to say what God says. God gave me to, to minister this message of godly confrontation because God is confronting, God is confronting some things, and, and it's not going to be pretty. Just get ready for it. It's not going to be pretty. God's going to uncover everything that's been covered up. And sometimes it is a good thing that some things come to the top. It was a good thing that this came to the top in Peter so he could be straightened out. Can you imagine if Paul had not confronted Peter, they would have went back to having a Jewish church and a Gentile church? Can you imagine what would have happened if, if, if there was no godly confrontation? We would have ended up going back to, to a Jewish church and a Gentile church. And Paul wasn't having it. Paul said, Peter, you're wrong. You're wrong. It's you. We must be in a position that we never allow the persons. He said, they, you know, these people are persons. They seem to be, uh, you know, famous or whatever. He said, but that, they don't add anything to me. In other words, and I'm not impressed. Peter, I, I know you're the one that preached on the day of Pentecost, but I'm not impressed by your hypocrisy. And people many times, leaders especially, leaders especially, if you consider yourself a leader and you're leading people, then you have to make yourself subject to accountability to God and to the church. You cannot be a lone ranger. Thank you, Jesus. Let me deal with one more thing and then I'm going to finish because I, I, I didn't know. I said, Lord, you gave me these things that I should share, that scripture, and then he gave me something he else he wanted me to share. And I said, this don't make no sense. It, does, it just really doesn't come together. But I'm going to share it because I believe the Lord wants me to share it. I'm going to share an article with you. I'm going to share an article with you that I think is, a, is an excellent article. And you can get this article. It's in, it was in, uh, it was in uh, um, uh, ministry, to, what, what, ministry Today, I think it is, or something like that. I want you to, I want you to, because I want to deal with this because I believe God is, has let me, let me find this information and I really believe the whole body of Christ needs it. I was going to put it on Facebook. I'm going to share it with you. I was just going to put it on Facebook for people to read. Just read it. It's, it's a, it's an article and uh, it's in uh, Christianity Today. So you can get it and you can, and you can read it. But I'm going to read it because, I very think, because we have just come out of an election. And I know, well, I'll talk about it. We've come out of an election. And, and, and the thing is, that the, 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 we know that the, 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 our nation has come out more divided than it was when we went in there. But the, the really bad thing is that the church has come out more divided than at any time. And we've had so many, we've had different prophecies about who would be the, the president and so on and so forth. And uh, I like what this, uh, Craig Keener, uh, he's, he's a, um, uh, let, me, let me give you his credentials. You can, um, and then I'm gonna read this article and then I'm gonna, this is gonna, I'm gonna be done. Craig Keener, um, professor of biblical studies at Ashbury Theological Seminary. He is the author of, of, of Christ, Christo Biography, Memories, History, uh, and the Reliability of the Gospels. So, you know, he's not just anybody. And, uh, but I thought what his article was, is I would, if I was going to deal with this issue of, 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 the, of prophecy around this election, I couldn't, I don't think I, the scriptures that he would, this is what I would be sharing 
and, and I thought that this was very good. Now, don't make Keener your favorite preacher now. It don't mean I agree with everything he says. Well, you know what else he said? I don't even know. I've never read him before. Okay? Please. But this, <laughs> you know, people, if you, if you say somebody's name, all, all of a sudden that's somebody, they think that I condone everything. Look, I'm your pastor. I'm going to give you the word of God. I'm going to love you. I'm going to live before you righteously. I'm going to see about you when you're sick. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to be there because that's my responsibility. I am your pastor. I am your shepherd. You need to hear my voice. I'm not saying you can't hear that, but you need to hear my voice. Amen? And this is the article, and I'm going to read it, and then I'll be done. When political prophecies don't come to pass. This is the article. He said, prophecy is saying what God says, which is more often about foretelling than about foretelling. Sometimes, however, prophecies do depict the future. In late October, Pat Robinson declared that he had heard from the Lord without question, Trump is going to win the election. To Robinson's credit, Trump did far better than expected. With Donald, with Donald Trump's 70 million votes, reportedly the second highest total in U.S. history, we might think that Robinson indeed heard something, but did he get the whole story? In some election prophecies, in some election prophecies are more than 50 50 guesses. In 2016, Jeremiah Johnson, a pastor and prophet, accurately predicted Trump's first term even before he emerged as a leader in the Republican primaries. Robertson was not alone in seeing another victory for the president in 2020. Most public prophecies, including those by Johnson, sided with Trump, sometime mentioning a disputed election. But even some who voted for Trump felt like God was saying that Biden would win this time. Ron Cantor, a Messianic leader based in Israel, said he twice heard from God that Biden would win because of the churches idolization of Trump. You cannot make somebody an idol and think God is going to sit there and allow it. He told followers, even if a miracle happened and Trump was in fact reelected, which seems less likely with each passing hour, proving, proving, and, uh, proving the other prophets true, the warning here remains the same. I like his warning. His warning is we cannot make Biden an idol. We cannot make Trump an idol. We cannot make the Democrat. Anytime you make something an idol, God will judge it. And he says, if the election result, uh, um, if the election result holds despite recounts, the court challenges, excuse me, if, if the election results hold despite recounts and court challenges, were all those others who predicted Trump's victory false prophets? Mistakes in prophecy do not make everyone who mistaken as a false prophet any more than mistakes in teaching makes everyone who is mistaken a false teacher. You know, we can make mistakes, can't we? We all human. But false prophets exist, even cessationists who do not believe in the genuine gift of prophecy is for today agree that they do. Whether from false prophets or not, very public mistaken prophecies risk great dishonor to God's name and must be treated especially seriously. People already apt to mock Christians can find more grounds to ridicule. Deuteronomy 18 warns against mistaken prophecy, albeit prophesying presumptuously. The Hebrew word typically involves insolent rebellion, such as Deuteronomy 1, 43 and 17 and 13. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place, this is the verse, or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken, reads Deuteronomy 18 and 22. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be alarmed. Yet even true prophecy can be messier than many would like. I, I like this. In the Bible, true prophets often acted in ways that other people considered eccentric. 
and their contemporaries sometimes deem them mentally unstable. In contrast to prophecies about God's long-range purposes, most prophecies in the Bible about his short-range purposes are conditional. Whether stated as such or not, thus Jonah, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. How many remember that prophecy? Was not fulfilled in Jonah's generation because Nineveh repented. So don't make everybody a false prophet because you know, they may have missed it. Amen? Jeremiah explains this process plainly. If any time I announce a nation or a kingdom to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if the nation I warn repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster that I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted and if it does, not, does evil in my sight and does not obey me then I will reconsider the good that I intended for it. In other words if they repent God will change right? If they don't repent. So prophecy is not always where someone just prophesies and it's just going to come to pass. There are other issues there are other things that has to come into play. Amen? perspectives on how conditional prophecy works vary. My opinion is that God foreknows human choices or final outcomes, but he also accommodates time-bound people within time. Similarly, God sometimes defers promises, promised outcomes. Elijah prophesied the destruction of Ahab. You remember when he told Ahab, you, Ahab, you're going to, you're going to, uh, um, God's going to judge you. Ahab fell down, humbled himself. God said, I'm not going to let it happen in your generation. I'm going to let it happen in other generations. So don't, get, so don't make everybody a false prophet. I'm not making everybody a false prophet that, because I understand, praise God, that God many times can, can, that things can shift in the spirit. Things can shift in the spirit. But I like this, and you need to read this because he gives the scriptures, and then you can go through these scriptures. These are the exact same scriptures that, that, that I, I would use if I was dealing with this issue so that people will not, because I heard one person on, on, on TV, one uh, TV uh, uh, um, evangelist or whatever you, you call them, has a TV show, say that people were calling him saying they were losing their faith. So, of course, that's going to concern any good leader and any good is that people were losing their faith because they thought that 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 Trump was going to be the the um, and it had been prophesied and they don't know whether they can believe prophets anymore. If you don't understand about prophecy, you'll be going around uh, condemning everybody and telling everybody they're a false prophet. And that's not what it's about. Ahab humbled himself, and as a result of humbling himself, God didn't allow it to come on uh, on on him. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move through. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm going down. It says, see, and also we got to understand about misinterpret. But uh, it says, but even godly people can sometimes misinterpret what they hear. Not everyone always hears God clearly as Moses did face to face. You remember when Nathan told David, said, look, build the temple. God build it. And then he went out and God said, no, go back and tell him that he can't build it. You have to be very careful. This problem is not, however, limited to court prophets. When John the Baptist heard that Jesus was healing people, he questioned his identity. Remember, he said, are you the one or should there be another one coming? So you see that John, John was, was interpreting it through his own lens. And you have to understand that many times prophets can hear God right, but they can get it, the interpretation of it wrong. Doesn't mean that they're a false prophet. It means, praise God, that we're all human and the prophecy is filtered through an imperfect being. Amen? Now, let me go. I'm, I'm going to skip down. Hearing different things. This is one of the headings. The most prominent people who claim to speak for God are not always right. But that does not mean that God does not speak. In 2008, an Ethiopian minister who did not know anything about me prophesied accurately about my son and that I was writing two big books. What confused me was that he said that the second book would be larger than the first. I expected my Acts commentary to come out first. It turned out 
to be over 4,000 pages. Though partly impressed, I thought Ms. Finn had to be wrong about this larger book. But my miracle, uh, but my miracle book, which turned out to be just 1,000 pages, ended up coming out before my Acts commentary. Ms. Finn was right. I was wrong. This year, many Christians have listened to, to leaders prophesied that Trump would again win the election. Some, such as Jeremiah Johnson, has continued to affirm that the prophecy will turn out to be true in the end. Now, God can do a miracle, and maybe Trump will get in there. Maybe it's a miracle that God's going to work out if he does. That's, but he's saying, but, and, and, and some are saying that it's still going to work out. You know, we'll see. But anyway, he says, others such as Chris Valadin have publicly apologized. For now, many will decide that the prophecy was contingent, mistimed, or more likely mistaken. Although I have not been a Trump supporter, I'm someone who wants to see godly prophecies proven true and can understand the disappointment. People are disappointed. I am not a prophet. He tells you, you're not a prophet. I'm not one either. Thank the Lord. I can go to sleep at night. I am not a prophet. But, on my, uh, but my own dreams gave me misgivings. For example, March 2016, eight months before the election, that's the first election of Trump, I dreamed that Trump could be like the biblical Jehu in 2 Kings 10 and 28 through 31 and needed repentance. Hmm. Have you ever heard anybody tell Trump, you need to repent? Mm -hmm. So he said that, 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 that he dreamed and um, he said that needed repentance. In May of 2016, that was in March, May of 2016, I dreamed that God was angry about Trump's future mistreatment of refugee ch children. This was before he ever did it with the refugee children. He said he had a dream that God was upset about what Trump had did with the refugee children. He said, uh, he, said, he said, later I dreamed about his words provoking race riots. Now, he ain't no prophet. He just had a dream. Now, I ain't no prophet. I, I told you my dream as a dream, okay? <laughs> he said, so he had a dream of provoking race, race riots. He said, after the 2016 election, I wrote in my journal, I wonder why when I have had these nightmare dreams about him, Many others are now not seeing the same thing. So you have to be careful. Everybody's saying, he's going to get in, he's going to get in, and you are a Micaiah prophet. How many remember Micaiah? It was 400 prophets saying that they were going to win the battle, and, and when they got Micaiah, Micaiah said, I see all y'all's bodies laying out there dead. <laughs> but we all must have the strength and the backbone of Micaiah to say the truth, whoever it is. Amen? He said he wondered why he having nightmare dreams about him and others are not seeing us. He said the next year I dreamed that I was warning Trump supporters about a coming backlash. You have sown the wind and you will reap the whirlwind. I was unable to shake those dreams, even though many people I respected supported the president. And for reasons that I understand, I understood. Sometimes my own perspective has vacillated since I am pro-life and appreciate the president's respect for evangelicals. In August this year, I dreamed that Trump lost the 2020 election. It was just a dream. See, tell a dream as a dream. It was just a dream. That's why I like what he did. It's just a dream. I have all sorts of dreams. And even when some seem significant, I am not always sure how to interpret them. Some are probably influenced by my surveying BBC News before I go to bed. The dreams do, but these dreams do motivate me at least to pray. See, when you get revelation or dream about something, you need to pray. Perspectives differ, and we each have just pieces of a larger puzzle. 
we can be sure of one thing. The Lord remains in control of history. And we can live by his certain word in scripture no matter what else happens. If against all odds, Trump suddenly does become president, the prophecies will draw public attention to God's work. Otherwise, it may instead be that God is drawing attention to needed house cleaping in many charismatic circles. Mm -mm. See, this is not a prophet. You don't have to be a prophet to have biblical perspective. The Spirit's encouragement does not always translate into words we want to hear. When the Spirit deals with us, it doesn't always deal with us telling us everything we want to hear. Sometimes it's, a, it's, a, it, it's, it's adverse to what we want to hear because God is getting our attention. I'm all, it's all, almost done. This is the last portion. He said, he said uh, the uh, the Spirit's encouragement doesn't always translate into words we can hear, we want to hear. Prophetic declarations can dull us to what God is really saying. And depending on what others say, God has said can be risky business. As a charismatic Christian myself, I like to see prophecies come true. But prophecies need to be evaluated whenever possible before they go public and when necessary afterwards. Now I'm going to stop there. There's other things. You can read this article uh, and, and you can get it online. But what I wanted to, to, to finalize with this is Paul makes it very clear in the 14th chapter of, of 1 Corinthians that prophecy must be judged. How many know that's true? Y'all learned that in prophetic school. It needs to be judged. And, 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 and if it needs to be judged, then, then, then we cannot say that the prophecies that come forth are just automatically infallible. And, and, and we must be uh, ready at all times to, to, to humble ourselves and, and show and demonstrate the humility of God so that the people of God will not be confused, so the people of God will not lose faith. We cannot make them think that we are infallible. You know, uh, it's no different, prophecy is no different from teaching and preaching. Uh, you know, in it, any of us, all of us that know and that minister the word of God know some sermons we wish that we had never preached. Sometimes we are, we're more anointed than we are. You know, some people think that, that, that uh, you know, you always, your anointing is always the same on every sermon. Uh, that ain't true. The only reason you see that on TV is because they don't show Bishop Jake's bad sermons. They ain't going to take his dog sermons and put it on. They put his hot sermons on there. Amen? I like what Kenneth Hagin said. He said, you can be anointed, more or less anointed, to do things that you do. I like old preachers. I like old preachers, I mean, you know, that have some wisdom. You, 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 so we must understand that prophecy, we need to judge prophecy. But we don't need to judge people. Don't judge prof. Don't judge prophets. Only time you judge prophets is when prophets... Uh, uh, a false prophet is a prophet that, is, that, that, is, that does not live. It doesn't mean that he's not accurate. He can be accurate, but his life doesn't measure up. So whatever uh, words that were released concerning this, this election, don't lose your faith because somebody got it wrong. Just know, praise God, that God never gets it wrong. Just know that God is still in control. Just know that God will fulfill his promise. He will take you through and he will bring you on the other side victorious. Come on, stand on your feet. Lift your hands to the Lord. Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord God. Father, we know, Lord God, that you are not a, uh, a God that, that brings division. Lord, you want us to walk together. Father, I ask you in Jesus' name that you will deal with all of our prejudices. Black prejudice, white prejudice, Asian prejudice. <laughs> any kind of prejudice that causes us to separate ourselves from one another. 
Father, that, we're not, that you, you said that there will be no schism in the body. Father, your church is biting and devouring one another. We've become cannibal Christians, eating up one another. God help us. Lord, you gave us the commandments. And you said that all of the commandments are fulfilled in these. I will love the Lord thy God with all of my heart, my mind, my soul, my strength, and love my neighbor as myself. Father, those are the, those are the guidelines. The, all other of those commandments are fulfilled in those two. To love you and love our neighbor. To love you and love one another. Beloved, let us love one another. For love of God and everyone that loveth is born of God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Father, let the love be the bond of perfection that you have spoken. Let your church begin to come together. Father, as you deal with us in the areas of, of race, in the areas of ethnicities, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that as we come together and share together, there is no uniting unless we come together. Father, I bind the spirit of of, of racism, I bind the spirit of division, I bind the spirit of injustice, I bind these spirits in the name of Jesus. And Father, I ask you to release upon us a new unity anointing that will come down upon us. And Father, in the days to come, as the persecution comes to the church, that we'll turn with our whole heart to you and to one another. Let the church come together, Father. Let us not be separated and divided any longer. Let us walk together in agreement, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. As you get your hands lifted, your eyes closed, Father, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice that does not know you as Savior and Lord, Lord, I ask you to convict them now in their hearts right now. Let them know that you are the way, the truth, and the life. You died for their sins. If you're, if you're a if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, all you need to do is just open your heart and your mouth and confess, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. You died on the cross, was buried, and the third day you rose from the dead. You are alive. You are my Savior. I receive you now, Savior and Lord of my life. Come into my heart. Cleanse me. Wash me. Make me new. I renounce Satan and I renounce Satan and sin. And I turn, her, turn, turn wholly to you. Devil, I command you to take your hands off of them now. I break every bondage, everything that ties them down to the old life. And I release them to walk. Holy Spirit, come upon them and fill them in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. You may be seated. We, is, isn't this the first Sunday? We're going to receive the Lord's table and we're going, to, we're going to minister to the sick as we do the Lord's table. So I want you to get the, those of you that are born again, get those, get the, get the, those elements. Hallelujah. His blood was shed for you. His blood was shed for you. Thank you, Lord. I can sense God's anointing. Just I, I feel like the anointing of God, just like somebody pouring something on my head, going down. His blood was shed for you. The anointing destroys the yoke. The anointing destroys the yoke. The same night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it. He said, this is my body, my body that was broken for you. Let's partake of it together. 
Thank you, Lord. He said, this is the new covenant, new in my blood. Drink ye all of it, let's drink together. Rabasuke. Manto kumbre isalamakai. Lift your hands for a moment. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bind every sickness and disease by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Zabonunge abrasokunda rabasata. Devil, loose their bodies now. I command you to be healed in Jesus' name. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Go through your body now. Let growths dry up. Let cysts disappear. Let tumors dissolve. Heal your people, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Minister your healing, O oh God, in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we pray for those that are struggling with with the coronavirus, we bind this demon spirit. We command in the name of Jesus that healing will flow into their bodies. We pray that their lungs will open up and they will breathe without restriction. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you cause, Lord God, there to be a, a mass miracle, Lord, of healing for those that are struggling with this virus. Bring them out, O oh God, whole. With no residue of this virus, no after effects of this virus in the name of Jesus. And we give you praise. Thank you, Lord. Now I want us to, before I let you go, I want us to pray for, uh, I, want you to, I want you to stand. If you're done, you received your, I want you to stand. We want to pray for, uh, for Bishop Plummer and Sister Pauline, his wife. And we want to, and, and we want to pray, we'll pray for, the, for, for them to be able to remain and do what God has given them to do there. Uh, we want to pray for their protection. And, and that they will, uh, you know, these, these, because the threats that have been made against them has been, I mean, these threats have been made in writing to the, against them. And, uh, but when I talked to him, he said, I, we are, we're going to stay and finish what God, you know, we want to stay and finish what God has given us to do. And uh, so we want to cover him. And I'm asking, we, we did send out a, a, for the intercessors to, Add that to your prayer and to pray that covering. So let's, let's pray for them now. Father, in the name of Jesus, you said go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And the plumbers are in Jerusalem. They are in Israel. And Father, I believe, Lord God, that there is a connection that you want to be made between the church of God in Christ, African Americans, and also in Israel. And Lord, and you've laid that mantle upon Bishop Plummer and Sister Pauline. I come against the works of the enemy. I come against Phariseeism that wants to destroy and to kill. And Father, I bind the enemy of assassination, terrorism, Father, I pray right now, Lord, that these demons be bound in chains and fetters of iron, that they be not able to, that they not be able to access this man and woman of God and those that are around them, Father. I pray, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that the government will get behind and support and cover them, Lord God, the government of, is, of, 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 of uh, 
of Israel. Father, I pray that the gospel will go forth in Jesus' mighty name. Korabasata. Kebrasata. Thank you, Lord. 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 Devil, in the name of Jesus, God's word is against you. Father, we send forth host of angels. Lord God, Sabor Oath, the Lord of the armies of heaven, release your armies into Jerusalem now, Father, to fend for, to fight for, to protect, to surround, to encourage, to secure, to strengthen, to lift up the Bishop Plummer and his dear wife, Father. Angels of God surround them. I cancel the schemes of the enemy. I cancel the assignments of the devil in the name of Jesus. And I loose the favor of God. Let favor come, Lord. You said you'd give us favor with God and man. Give him favor with the Israeli government. Give him favor with the Israeli people, oh God. Give him favor, Lord God, with the more moderate voices in the nation. In Jesus' mighty name. Lord, we hold them up. Oh, we know not what to pray for as we all, but the Spirit of the Lord knows all things. Uncover the schemes of the enemy. Uncover the plans of the enemy. The name of Jesus. Korabasata. And protect them, O God. And let, their, let them fulfill the assignment that you have given them, O God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah. Put your hands together and give God praise. Kabra Sataya. Rasatara Masata. Glory to God. Ooh, there is such an anointing of God in this place. Ah, Shata Masata. Shata Basata. Shata Basata. There are signs and wonders that God is about to release in the persecuted church. We're about to see miracles. We're about to see signs and wonders. God is about to do something so awesome. He's going to cause the church to be required to hit, their, hit its knees again. To see the glory of God revealed. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. As we go from this place, cover us with your angels. Protect us, shield us, keep us. Draw us together, Lord, as one. We give you all of the praise in Jesus' name. God bless you. You are dismissed.